Trying to see if we're live. Okay, we should be, okay, we have more part, yep, so we are live. So, hello everyone, quick apologies for that technical error. My name is Alfredo Rivera, I'm the Regional Development Manager here in Central New Mexico for the Alzheimer's Association. Uh, just a big, big shout out to our supporters, our sponsors, our volunteers, our donors, our caregivers, all 108,000 of them across New Mexico. You, you all are the front runners and you know, if, if it wasn't for you all, we would be stuck in a different kind of situation. So, you know, big, big shout out for, to all of you all. Um, we're going to leave Q&A towards the end, so go ahead and include it in the chat box. Um, I will introduce Mr. Rick Vinay, who will talk about how to cope with caregiver burnout during the COVID-19 pandemic. Again, big apologies, everyone, but um, I think it's going to be worth it. So, Mr. Rick Vinay, go ahead and take it over. All right. Thank you, Alfredo. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And let's just get to the beginning here. Now, can everyone hear me okay? Can you see my screen okay? And I'll just rely on, on Alfredo because uh, it's hard for me to see your comments, but um, looks like everything's okay. Everything's good, Mr. Vinay. Thank you so much. So I'm happy to be here. I apologize for the delay. Um, I, you know, it's interesting working in this field of um, taking care of oneself and working as a social worker for many years. It's always interesting when, uh, when I get to practice what I preach, so to speak. So things, the technology wasn't working so great for me. And um, anyway, I'm here today and, and we'll put that behind us. So thank you very much for joining me. Uh, I, I've been a social worker for about uh, 25 years, um, worked in a lot of different fields, have seen a lot, have um, tried to help as many people as I possibly can. So what I'm going to be sharing today is based mostly on experience and things that I've witnessed, things that I've, um, that I've used myself and things that I've helped others to use and probably a focus on self-care is what we're going to be looking at. So uh, to start off, what we're going to look at is, we're going to start by looking at kind of identifying some of the things that we're seeing, uh, we're gonna look at compassion fatigue, uh, burnout, secondary trauma, and moral injury. So that's the first thing that we'll be looking at is what are some of the signs and symptoms? Some things might ring a bell. If they do, then uh, when we get to the second part, we're gonna be looking at developing ways to prevent or maybe overcome these symptoms if we've noticed that we're experiencing some of them. So, uh, so let's go ahead and get started. That's pretty much our agenda for the day. So just some things to keep in mind, some uh, vocabulary, so to speak, compassion, satisfaction. So, you know, I think I always like to start out by saying compassion is not a bad thing. Compassion is a really good thing. Compassion has a lot of um, power behind it. You know, if you look at the root of the word, it's passion. So many of us have a passion to help others. And uh, so that's a good thing. And we always want to build on that and we want to keep that in mind. So I'll talk more about that today. Uh, fatigue is the negative aspects of working with others in a, in a helping capacity. So, you know, we've probably all had situations where maybe we're stretched to our limits and we start to feel fatigued. So it's interesting that we've, um, as, as a society, we've kind of linked those two words together in some ways. So we're going to look at um, how those two might fit together and some of the the information around that and some ways to look at addressing that. Burnout is feeling ineffective and overwhelmed. So many of us in this field have, have experienced maybe some burnout, maybe come close to it. Uh, so we'll take a, a brief look at that. And then also work-related traumatic stress. So working with others who are experiencing uh, huge amounts of trauma or stress, um, struggling with health issues, maybe behavioral health issues. Uh, we, we experience the what we call the secondary trauma 
um, from working with people, helping them. And then the moral injury is something that we're seeing more of. We're seeing more of this with the COVID uh, because we're, we're, we're being asked to do things that uh, maybe aren't how we're, we're wired and how we are used to doing things. Um, so maybe it's looking at behaviors or things that we have to do that, um, that maybe go against our values a bit or our moral beliefs. So we'll take a look at that as well today. So just some definitions, we touched on this earlier. So compassion, you know, it really does motivate us. It's what, what drives our desire to help others. So as I said earlier, compassion is a really good thing. If you look at the root of that word, it's passion. So from passion, there's a lot of enthusiasm and excitement. Uh, you know, we have a lot of enthusiasm or excitement for helping others. So that's our passion. Compassion motivates us to want to work with others. Um, the thing is, <clears throat> where the fatigue comes in is when we're, we're pushing ourselves beyond maybe what, um, what's healthy for us or maybe what we feel is our limits. So, you know, and that can be a different spot for all of us. And, you know, I think one of the things that we want to keep in mind with COVID is what we're seeing a lot in, in the people that come in for some, maybe some support, coaching, counseling, is that all of us have a, a certain level of stressors that were in our lives already. And then you add COVID to, to that equation and it, it, it adds to our stressors. So maybe the things that, that we used to be able to do with this added stress, we might, not, we might not find that we're having quite the same amount of energy that we used to. Um, and I'm just here to say, be aware of that and, and, and acknowledge that. And, and I would say, understand it and be okay with it to a degree. You know, we're not superhuman. We're just not. Uh, we, many times it can feel like we are because of what we're, what we're accomplishing in the course of a day and how many people we help. Uh, but keep in mind that with COVID, um, the fatigue can be, can be heightened. So I always like to take a look at this slide anytime that we're talking about stress, burnout, compassion fatigue, uh, moral injury, secondary trauma, because all of us have a lot of resilience. We couldn't be doing what we're doing without having the resilience that we've built up over the years. And so this, this curve basically shows our stress resilience. And you can see, I think we're all very much aware of this, that you know, there's, there's a certain amount of stress that's good for us. We call that the use stress. It, it motivates us, it ties in with our compassion, it pushes us, it's, it's exhilarating actually. Um, anyone that's ever trained to uh, be in any sort of a sporting event, knows this type of stress. It's like, you know, I've known many people, I have never had the desire, but I have known people who had the desire to run a marathon and I've watched them go through building up their resilience or endurance to be able to run a marathon. To me, watching them, it doesn't look like a lot of fun, but actually for them, they love it. It's exhilarating. And you can see that they're pushing themselves. They're, they're building up their stress stress levels um, in resilience. And so there's a lot of motivation and energy that comes from that. The thing that I think we all want to be aware of is we all have an inflection point. And you can see that's when the curve starts to dip down and it can turn into distress, fatigue, uh, exhaustion. You know, you can see some of the, in the box there, some of the, uh, the symptoms that we might notice in ourselves when we're starting to get onto that, that um, right hand of the curve. So I think it's just important to, to be aware of that and to know that we all have our limits and to be okay with that and to be okay to say no when we've hit that limit. Now, something else to keep in mind, and we'll look at this a little bit later, is we can move that inflection point. Um, some days you might notice that it's a little bit further to the right and we can take on more. Other days might be a little bit further to the left and we just have to know that that day is one day that we're not gonna be able to push ourselves or we're gonna start falling into the, the fatigue, the exhaustion and the burnout part of that curve. So it's helpful to keep that in mind and to know, like I, I always like to kind of keep a mental image of this in my mind to know when I'm approaching that point where it's gonna to start to go downhill so that I can kind of preempt that and go, you know what? I need to go to lunch or I need to take a couple minutes and just go walk around the building. Something, something to like move my mind away from whatever my stressors are in that moment. You know, if I'm with a, a client, a patient, then that's probably not something I can do. 
but I do know that in my next break, I need to do something. And um, so I think this is an important curve to keep in mind. Take this with you. Gonna go to the next slide here. So we're gonna look at some of the symptoms of compassion fatigue. And so there's a definition of compassion fatigue. And you know, so usually there are three ways that people experience this. So um, avoidance, numbing of reminders, uh, persistent arousal, we just kind of always stay up here, you know, kind of like the adrenaline rush. Uh, we sometimes we'll call it like adrenaline junkies, where we're just we're constantly aroused. You know, that's that's when, you know, at the end of the day we're just still going and maybe we were we calm down a bit and then when we get to go we try to go to sleep and we're back into that arousal state. So um, not uncommon for that to happen, especially we're seeing that more with the COVID, you know, not to sound um, negative, but I think just something to be aware of. And then intrusive thoughts of the event. So here are some things that we can be aware of with avoidance. And maybe you've experienced some of these, maybe you see them in a coworker or notice them. And I bring that up because I think it's nice to help people that we're working with especially now there's this added sense of isolation. And so when we're experiencing these symptoms, there's not someone next to us to say, hey, you know what, I think you're, I think you're really stressed, you need to take a break. Um, so I would say watch for these symptoms in others, not only in ourselves, but in, in, uh, in the folks that we interact with as well. And that's why we'll look at this later, it's good to stay connected. So silent, silencing response, you know, we just, we've had enough. We kind of have, we all have this situation, I would imagine, but um, kind of avoiding certain patients and their stuff. It's like, you know, we just, we kind of can't, can't look at that or we, we feel like we're just not ready to, um, to deal with that. So we might start to avoid certain situations or people. Um, loss of enjoyment, pretty straightforward. Maybe our energy levels are a little bit lower. Um, start to lose hope. This is when we can start to move from maybe the fatigue to the burnout um, levels. So losing our energy, loss of hope, uh, loss of sense of competency. You know, I'm hearing this quite a bit. Uh, we work with, with um, some of the COVID units and the healthcare workers. And, you know, all of us are wired to do a good job. You know, I've, I've worked in the employee assistance program field for about... Um, close to 20 years. And, and my experience is everybody gets up in the morning, wants to do a good job. Some coworkers, we might not be convinced that's true, but it is true. <laughs> so we all have this sense of wanting to do a good job. And when we're over, overwhelmed, um, maybe reaching the point of being overwhelmed, we start to feel like we question our competency and maybe our potency, our ability to help others. So just something to be aware of. Um, when you notice these symptoms, um, time to do something about it. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. And then of course, isolation. We have the, the situation currently where there's, you know, people feel more isolated with COVID, of course. Um, so there's this, this sort of, it takes a little bit more energy to be creative to figure out how to connect with others. So the isolation is um, something that we're seeing quite a bit of these days. Also looking at symptoms of arousal. So this is what I was saying earlier. We're always sort of, um, sort of at this more hyper, hyper vigilant kind of amped up state. So, you know, when you look at that, we're feeling more maybe anxiety. Uh, we're seeing many, many more folks come in with, um, with symptoms of anxiety. Um, you know, our panic attacks. And so just be aware of when we're, when we're getting into these symptoms of arousal to realize that, you know what, I need, to, I need to slow down. I need to, almost it feels like forcing ourselves to get out of the sense of arousal. That can, that can, take a, that can be a challenge at times to, um, to get ourselves out of that, that sense of arousal. And, you know, some of that is because we need some of that to get through a day. We kind of have to get our adrenaline going. We have to get up there um, into that state of arousal. But then we also need to bring ourselves back down. Otherwise, we, we can really start to have an impact, not only on our, our emotional health, our mental health, but also our physical health. Um, so, you know, we start to see things as a perception or demand, uh, both in our job and our environment. Uh, I, I'm just going to say that, you know, what we're experiencing is also with the situation around, um, we'll call it maybe civil unrest, and with the election coming up, you know, there's this sense of arousal. So the news media, you know, our jobs, helping others, all of that just kind of keeps us rubbed up. And I'm just going to say it now, I think I, I mentioned it later on, but um, 
one thing that I encourage people to do is to take news breaks. So maybe we can't like unplug completely, but it is good to take news breaks and um, just, you know, step away from the news a little bit now and then because it does tend to keep us in a hyper aroused state. I was talking to someone yesterday, a friend, and she said, you know, I'm on my phone watching election results. And she said, I keep my, I keep like refreshing my screen. <laughs> I, said, I said, you know what? I've done that a few times too. Like, let me see if maybe it's just not refreshing. Um, so anyway, you get the point that that sense of being in a aroused state. So just be aware of it. Um, also comes out in frustration and anger. Um, I know that's really, that can be difficult when we're working with patients and clients because it can be frustrating. Let's face it. We're working with systems. We're working with people in pain. We're working with people that are confused. And so that can get frustrating. And, and I think we have this, this added um, requirement that we can't really show that. So we have to hold it in for quite a bit of time. And I think it's good to get that out at times. Otherwise, we stay in that aroused state. So I mentioned earlier, sleep disturbance, difficulty concentrating, very common, and then change in weight or appetite. So could either be an increase or decrease, either happens. Um, some other symptoms, intrusive. You know, we kind of can't leave, leave our job, so to speak, our patients behind us at the end of the day. So, you know, they kind of creep into our own time. We see and in, in experience a lot of things. Um, you know, even though it's secondary, it has an impact. You know, we have, we have big hearts. We wouldn't be in this field if we didn't. And so, you know, those things have an impact on us. And I always like to say it's okay to acknowledge that. Because trying to avoid it, um, it just keeps trying. My experience is, and, and I think for most of us, it just keeps trying to seep in. Uh, the more we just try to go, nope, I, I'm not going to deal with this. It just keeps kind of trying to get back in. Um, sometimes, you know, it's, it's that, that thing where I'll wake up at night and it's just like, ooh. Um, or it seeps into my dreams and I have these really bizarre dreams. And so um, I found that acknowledging that and going, that was a tough situation. And I've even taken the, the steps where I've just taken time to, like I'll set my, my timer for five minutes and go, you know what, I just, I'm just going to focus on this for five minutes and then I'm going to put it down. And, and I like to do it, the timer on my phone because I'll hold it and then I'll put it down and go, that's it, leave it alone. Um, you know, obsessive and compulsive, second point, obsessive and or compulsive desire to help certain clients, like we're just really um, tied in. And you know, this is, this is where I think, you know, this, this is where a lot of our compassion fatigue comes from, is we, we have to let go, let go of what we don't have control over and to realize that we can only do so much to help others. You know, it's not the compassion that burns us out. It's the it's the the drive to a result, and sometimes we have to let go of that result and go. You know what? This is not my hands. I have done everything that I can and let it go. Sometimes that means you know faith in something. Sometimes that also could mean um, allowing someone to to have their process and realize that it's their process. You know, especially I see that um, I'm sure in your field, but in behavioral health. You know, I, I can work with the client to help them see something, maybe do something a different way. But at the end of the day, I have to say, you know what, they're going to leave here and do what they want to do. Comes in handy with kids too, let me tell you. <laughs> they're going to do what they want to do. I'll help, but I have to let go of the outcome. I have to, or else that's what will burn me out. I've learned that. Um, and if I I can almost remember the day where I did because if I, if I hadn't learned that in this career, I, I would have left it, I can tell you that. Um, so you get the, the idea that obsessive or compulsive desire, we just can't let go of trying to help them. Um, you know, client issues encroaching on personal time. I know especially now with COVID for most of us, it's hard to figure out what's our work time and our personal time. It just all kind of becomes one blur. Um, so we have to do some things to, to be aware of that. Um, this ties in with what I was talking about earlier, that inability to let go of our mission. Um, you know, there's a lot that goes on in the course of a day that, that we're, not, we're not in control of. We, ju we just aren't. We can do what we can, but we, we can't do it all. Um, and then, you know, maybe perceiving clients or patients as um, maybe fragile and that they, they need me or else they're not going to be able to, to, to get through the day or whatever it might be. So just something to keep in mind. Helps us to get a gauge of you know, where we're at, what, what capacity we're working at, and what 
um, what level we're working at currently. So just, you know, answer for yourself, you know, how many individuals do you counter in the course of just one work week that are experiencing pain or trauma? You know, I've worked with people that it's 40 plus. I worked with some nurses where, you know, it's a hundred people in a week. It's like, that's, that's a lot. So um, keep in mind, you know, what's your gauge and where are you at? So just quickly, we can run through these slides. Um, compassion fatigue, you know, the, the symptoms there, they're very similar, but um, sometimes it's helpful to know the source and to give it sort of a, maybe a, a name. I'm not big on labels or names, but, but sometimes it can help with um, maybe more like a diagnosis to know like, how is it that I'm going to address um, my, I like to think of it as a, a as a care plan is, you know, once I understand and give it a name, a diagnosis, then I know what my care plan is going to be. So, um, so sometimes it can be helpful to understand and differentiate between these two. So um, we talked about compassion fatigue, PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, this is when we experience a trauma directly. So, you know, pretty straightforward. Maybe we're living in a, in a situation that's very stressful, um, maybe you know, close to abusive, that's of course creating a lot of stress. Um, could be chronic stress, that sort of situation where we're living in a situation that's um, very stressful, so chronic. Um, could be something like a, an acute trauma, maybe you know, car accident or something that happened to us um, that created the, that str the increased stressors and, and kind of crossed the line where it's, it's eating into our, our ability to, to live our lives and to live them fully. So that's um, post-traumatic stress disorder. When we, when we experience um, the trauma directly, either chronic or acute. Um, secondary trauma, you know, I think we tend to discount this. And this is when we're working with people who are exposed to trauma, um, maybe experiencing, you know, severe health conditions or whatever it might be. So, you know, secondary trauma is usually, um, it can be acute, but it's usually more chronic. So I think it tends to sneak up on people. We don't see it coming as as often as we do with a with an acute trauma and a and a direct trauma where we're like whoa, like I experienced that I I know the impact it had on me. When it's chronic, sort of not high levels, maybe so high levels of um, trauma, but just chronic day in and day out, uh, working with others in that state is secondary trauma, and it can start to wear on us. So once again, ref reflect back to that, um, that stress curve and know when, when you're starting to get into, whether it's from the, the primary trauma that we've experienced, secondary trauma, um, whether it's fatigue, or um, what we're gonna look at in a minute is the burnout. Know where you're at on that curve and, and keep it in mind. So burnout, I like to say that it takes longer to experience. Usually it doesn't happen um, with one event. Um, could be our fatigue from, from caring for others might be a factor. And usually there's a component with burnout, there's a, there's a component that's a frustration like paperwork or red tape. Um, you know, I always like to tell a story. Quite a few years ago, I was working in an adolescent um, treatment center and I came out of my office one day and I was, I was just kind of like disoriented. And another counselor came out of his office at the same time. And we looked at each other and I said, what's up, Michael? And he goes, he goes to be honest with you, my clients are, are really getting in the way of my paperwork. <laughs> and I will never forget that because I thought, oh my gosh, you just nailed it. That, that's, what's, that's what is, is like really exhausting me is I've, I had, there's so much paperwork with each client that um, it really wasn't the clients that were, that were such a high contributing factor to my burnout as it was the, the red tape and the bureaucracy. And you know, that can be frustrating because, because myself and the, my fellow counselor, we were wired to help, we wanted to help. And it felt like that red tape was getting in our way which you know that you can see how that that will tend to, to lead to burnout um, could be in an environment of course uh, could be our colleagues you know sometimes our colleagues can uh, can contribute to burnout um, and then pace and grind of work of course so moral injury as I mentioned in the beginning this is something that we're seeing more of um, 
because with COVID, um, we're having to do things in a different way. I'll say it that way. Um, and sometimes it, it can be taxing because, you know, maybe it's a situation where we're not able to be there with our client or patient in a way that we feel we need to be. And we feel like, you know, that goes against my, my values and my moral beliefs. I believe that I should be able to be there and maybe even, you know, hold a person's hand. That, that in and of itself is difficult and challenging. And so, you know, sometimes it's, it's a situation where maybe we have to make a decision about what we can do. And, you know, it goes maybe against our values. And, and with COVID, there's an, there's an added dynamic where, you know, there, there's this distancing, whether it's through a mask or whether or not we can visit with the patient, whatever it might be, um, that, that has a, a, adds a whole different dimension. And it, what I'm seeing is that can contribute to the moral injury, the feeling like we're just not really able to um, contribute and, and do our jobs in a way that we feel um, is in alignment with our values and our moral beliefs. And so, you know, it's just something to keep in mind. So these are some physical symptoms. Um, we'll just spend a couple moments on this just to, to run through them, but uh, you can kind of see, you know, if these physical symptoms become extreme, then um, I would say it's time to get in and talk with someone. Um, you know, definitely get in and talk with someone and, and work with someone to help you put a plan together. Sometimes that's just really difficult to do on our own and it takes someone outside ourselves and that's okay, it's totally okay. Um, one thing that we're seeing is that there's much more, almost all tel telemental health now. And I think that's, that's been actually not such a bad thing because it saves on travel time. Um, you can be much more portable, you can plug it into a spot. Um, you know, also therapy hours aren't set in stone at 50, 50 minutes, you can, you know, maybe set up something to talk for a half hour or whatever amount of time you have. But just keep in mind, if you're seeing these physical symptoms, then definitely reach out and, um, and get some help. Psychosocial, we've talked about many of these. Um, something that we're seeing a lot of is just the extreme grief. Um, along with that guilt, of course, but, but just grieving. Sometimes we're not even aware. We've had to let go of so much. Um, and it's almost a daily process where we're letting go of something. And so it's just, I think, important to be aware that there's, there's grief there. And it's okay. You know, in our culture, we tend to go grieve it and get over it. It's like maybe we need to spend a little bit of time grieving and, and allow ourselves to do that. Because otherwise, you know, it can turn into some of, this, um, some of these other symptoms of um, frustration, anger, depression. So, you know, second-guessing careers, that comes up quite a bit these days. Um, fear of damaging, you know, maybe we feel like we're not able to, to do our jobs at the, the standard that we're no, normally used to. And then um, avoidance of certain patient care areas. We see this quite a bit in nursing, of course. So just to take a moment to think about where is your fatigue coming from, because that can also help with, um, with your care or treatment plan to think about, okay, I know where I need to focus. And I'm happy to share these slides as well. Um, so just some human symptoms. We don't need to spend much time on this. We've already talked about most of this. Um, probably the altered sense of time is something that we're seeing uh, quite a bit of with COVID. You know, a, a day can seem like a month. A month can seem like a day. It's like, I don't know, it's just up for grabs. So um, just some human symptoms to be aware of. Organizational symptoms. Um, some of the things, you know, it, it's difficult to be doing everything on Zoom. It's difficult to be not as connected with our, our coworkers as we used to be. I did some work with a group that actually they are working together in, in their facility, and, um, but they're just, they can't connect like they used to. And so that has an impact. This is where I would say, you know, um, it's important to stay connected. So for the organization, some tips. Um, schedule regular meetings, just put them in your calendar, meet with someone, meet, meet as a group, you know. Um, I think it's really important that our groups get together and schedule weekly time so that we can just touch base. You know, we've had, we, we have a weekly meeting where we don't even have an agenda. It's just, let's just get together and talk. <laughs> and it's actually been a lot of fun. Um, 
we did a show and tell the other day. It just happened spontaneously where someone had been working on a craft and they said, oh, let me go get it. And they brought it and someone else had something. So um, those regular meetings are good. It's a good to connect, especially now. Um, it helps to encourage communication. Um, also, right now, I think it's, it's important to be aware of what is our role, what are our defined roles, our routines, responsibilities, networks. Um, you know, we, I think many of us have these policies and procedures, these roles, routines. All of a sudden, everything changed around the middle of March. And, you know, it's hard to know, like, are you doing that or do I do that? Who's doing what? Um, so be aware of those and try to, um, to define them. Invest in technology, that's so important. Um, make sure that you have, you know, if you need, if you need a headset, um, get one. If you, need, if you need a laptop, find a way to get one. Whatever it is, um, technology is so important. I know at first my technology was so outdated, it was so frustrating and finally I just bit the bullet and said, I've got to do something because I'm, I'm like increasing my stress about tenfold. Uh, set an example, individualize your approach. You might have to take a different approach. Celebrate lessons learned. I think it's so important, especially now, to celebrate any time that you have a success. To, you know, maybe in that weekly meeting or whenever you touch base with someone, spend a few minutes talking about something that went well, something that was a success. And then know your resources. Always important, but especially now. Uh, just some things to we're moving into self-care, how to take care of ourselves. Just be aware of your own obstacles. And these are some common quotes that I've heard uh, with folks that I've worked with. Um, you know, one that's really common is it would be selfish for me to take a break from this work. The trouble with that one is we, we know this intellectually, but maybe not as much um, in our heart, is that if we don't take a break, if we don't take care of ourselves, there's not going to be anything left to help others. So, so it's really not selfish. Self-care is really important. It's not selfish at all. And we need to be able to do that. We need to be able to set those limits to do the self-care. Um, the other thing is, you know, we, especially in the professions that we're in, we tend to work together and everyone's a hard worker. So we feel a bit guilty if we're not working as hard as maybe we think we, we need to be or someone else is. Um, or fooling ourselves into thinking, I'm okay, I'm fine, I'm not even tired. It's like, really? This is where other people are important because I can give you a tip. When I'm stressed, my shoulders come up and I'm not aware of it, but everybody that I work with is. So even on a Zoom call, if my shoulders are like this, they'll be like, wow, you must be stressed. And I'm like, I am? <laughs> so you get the picture. Um, rely on those around you. Tell them it's okay to let you know if they notice something. Um, and then this idea that only I can do it. No one else can do this. Um, not doing enough. Uh, I can contribute the most by working all the time. You know, we start cutting into our breaks, our lunch times, our dinners. So um, don't do that to yourself. That's all I'm going to say. Uh, needs of others are more important. This is very common. Um, and sometimes we're trying to cover it. It's like I don't want anyone to know what I'm going through. Personal tips. Fight the urge to multitask, I would say don't do it. You can't multitask, we're, we're doing what, what they call switch tasking. Um, if you ever wanna do something fun, there's an exercise called uh, multitasking is a myth. It's switch tasking. So you can do a, a search on multitasking, switch tasking exercise, and you can go through an exercise and it, it proves, it proves, I think without a doubt, that we're not multitasking, we're doing a bunch of different things and we're not focusing on any of them enough to really get it done. And it's, it's, it, it contributes to burnout. So um, be aware, do one thing at a time, try to schedule your time. So important to let go of what you can't control. I'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, good to warm up our brain in the morning. Spend a few minutes just, you know, thinking of things you're grateful for. Start warming up your brain. Um, you know, not getting into the doom and gloom, just think, you know what, I'm going to take five minutes for myself. Um, that doesn't mean that we're going to shower and brush our teeth. It means that we're going to take five minutes to do something. Um, you know, read something inspirational. Uh, do something that, that uplifts you. So establish clear boundaries. Of course, we've talked a bit about that. Know what your triggers are. Um, turn off your devices, you know, take a break. As I mentioned earlier, take a news break and then listen to what your body's telling you. So self-control, really important. I like to keep this 
in my it, like in the back of my mind at all times. What what stresses us out in the course of a day? I think it's probably at least ninety percent of our stress is we're focused on trying to do so many things. If we really check, many of them are on outside of our control. So we have to take a moment to go, what are the things that I have control of? That's that small red dot, <laughs> it's about that big. Um, what can I influence, a little bit bigger? And then if we check, you know, many things are outside our control. And we just have to keep this in mind. This is such a good tool to reduce our stress, to, to look at it. Well, like when, when, we, when we are getting really stressed out, to take a break and go, what do I have control over? Just inside our mind, think, what do I have control over? You know, I even do this with my schedule. I do it every single day. I come in, I'm all motivated. I've taken my time <laughs> to set my pace and my goals, and I'm gonna set the world on fire. I have this great agenda in front of me. My, my you know, my time is all scheduled out, what I'm going to be doing. At the end of the day, um, my calendar and agenda, many days looks pretty much the same as when I came in the morning. <laughs> I laugh because it's, it happens day in and day out. And I have to go, you know what? The day is over. Let it go. It, this is outside of my control. You know, I've put in more than enough time today. And you know, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, well, I could do some things and then I don't have to face them tomorrow. And it's like, let it go. You know, the day, your work day is over. It's outside your control. Stop. Just stop. And I have to give myself permission to do that and walk outside and go, this is outside my control. Some days it's not so hard. Some days I have to go, you know what? It doesn't matter. I need to do it. Um, I love the self-care and acceptance uh, graph. I keep this one in my mind, too. Do I have a problem in my life? No, then don't worry. Pretty simple. Do I have a problem in my life? Yes. So then the question is, can I do something about it? If the answer is no, <laughs> get back to don't worry. Can I do something about it? Yes, then go do it. Um, yes, got cut off, but don't have control over that. Um, so if I can do something about it, then I go do it or put on my list of things that I'm going to do something about. But if you look at this, it's actually... Um, you know, I've worked with, with people with addictions over the years, and it's basically the serenity prayer. You know, God or whomever, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Um, that's exactly what this is. If, if we can't do anything about it, worrying does not give us any control. I think we, we, we believe that it does. Like if I worry about this and I take it with me wherever I go, I'm maintaining control. We're not. We're just worrying. We're just eating into our own health and, and well-being. So um, I guess the message is stop worrying. Uh, distraction and deliberate, you're turning your attention away from the crisis. So some of you might have heard of Marsha Linehan. She um, pretty much invented the dialectic behavioral therapy. And this is something that she um, is a huge proponent of. And it's staying in our wise mind. And um, using deliberate distractions is what she calls them to take our attention away from from our crisis or worry so you know staying in our wise mind and and she i love acronyms so she uses accept so using activities um, to take our mind off of worry and crisis so doing something that we enjoy some fun activity schedule it push yourself to do it even if you don't feel like doing it push yourself um, contributing to others you know i think we all know that it's in giving that we receive um, so contributing, but at the same time, not contributing so much that it, it um, starts to wear us out or starts to fatigue us. Um, also, one thing, this is more something to avoid, is comparisons. Like, um, you know, that person did that better than I did or that sort of thing. So try to avoid comparisons. We are who we are. Um, opposite emotion. You know, I use this a lot with anger. When I'm angry, I realize that I'm not accepting the situation. I'm angry. It's not, this is not what I wanted when I woke up this morning, or this is not how I want the situation to be going. So, you know, election is a good example of that. It doesn't matter um, whomever we voted for, or whatever we believe. Um, our anger comes from not accepting the situation. So, you know, I think internally, like, accept, just accept it. It's called patience. And that anger goes away. Doesn't mean that I, you know, it doesn't mean that you can't do something to address it, but you do it without anger. 
Um, so it's kind of discerning what we call the internal and the external problem. So the external problem we can solve, we can, you know, in this situation, maybe donate or, or do something constructive um, to address the situation, but internally we don't do it with an angry mind. You know, anger doesn't have good qualities. We think that it does, but it really doesn't. It's just, it's a negative mind. So we can do it with a mind of patience and acceptance. So that's an opposite emotion. Instead of anger, patience, that's a big one. That, that one in and of itself can take us a long way. Um, pushing away, if something is affecting us negatively, we can look at it and then put it down, as I talked about earlier. And then using our thoughts to focus on positive things and using our sensations. Um, our five senses to calm us. Uh, one thing that I always like to remind folks, especially in the helping field, is keep your why in mind. Stay connected to purpose, as we say. Why did we get into this? Um, because if we're, if we're focused on our why, like I love doing what I do, then the how and the what isn't quite as much of a challenge. It doesn't wear us down as much. If we're focused on the what and the how, the what and the how, the what and the how, how am I going to do this? What am I going to do? What do I need to do it? If we're constantly focused on that, of course we need to do those things. But if we keep our why in mind, they're easier. It's like I'm doing this because I, I care for others. I love to help others. And so that will help us with the what and the how. So it's working from the inside out. Um, more of a what we call a remarkable person rather than the outside in and you know always focusing on how am I going to do it what am I going to do how am I going to do it what am I going to do so you get the picture focusing on our our purpose our why why do we do what we do uh, talked about this earlier with uh, with accepts you know using our five senses our sight sound smell taste and touch uh, just some simple things to keep in mind you know you can always um, ground ourselves. This is really helpful when we're in that um, aroused state to use our senses to, to bring ourselves down. You know, kind of like I've thought about this at times. Um, I worked with, um, with people with, with sensory integration challenges and you probably have all seen the weighted blankets and I've seen them like I saw them at Costco not too long ago and I was like I think I'm going to try a weighted blanket. Because um, you know when you think about your five senses I didn't get one but I'm still thinking about it. Like I just think I, when I'm really hyper aroused, I could just see myself laying on my, my floor here in the office and then um, maybe put a weighted blanket on me. <laughs> just the visual alone helps. But anyway, you get the sense. Use your five senses to ground yourself. Um, collaborate with others. We talked about that earlier. Be accountable to yourself. Be accountable to your peace of mind. Respect others. Respect this virus and the impact that it's having on everyone. Um, helps us to stay centered, helps us to stay calm. Respect what it is. Um, if others don't, we don't have control over that. You know, it gets back to what we were talking about earlier. We don't have control. Um, maybe we say something to them if they're not respecting it. Maybe we don't. But, but respect it for yourself and focus on ourselves. Um, engage with others. Engage with, you know, passions, things that we like to do. We've talked quite a bit about that. So um, care for yourself by engaging, engaging with, you know, this beautiful, we live in such a great environment. Um, I live over in Cedar Crest and, and so I, I hike quite a bit. And, you know, since COVID had start, has, has changed people's way of lives, I see so many people out on the trail now. And um, families with little little guys, like little kids. And I think this is great, you know, from such a horrible situation, here's something really positive coming from it. There's a lot of families out there enjoying nature and it's like, great, they're engaging. Um, and then serving others, there's no honor like it. We know this. So um, be okay with that and don't focus on the, the negative side of serving others. You know, the what and the how and the, the red tape and the bureaucracy, just, you know, celebrate those little things like, um, not too long ago, I was, I was seeing a client. I came out of my office. It was a tough client. Um, sounds like that happens to me quite a bit. Maybe it does. But anyway, I came out of my office and um, another counselor came out of her office. I said, wow, that, that was intense. And I looked at her and I said, why, why do we do this? And she said, Rick, it's called intermittent reward. And she said, you know, when something, when you help someone and it goes well, 
She said, that feeling of exhilaration of knowing that you just helped someone improve their life. You help them in some way. She said, there's nothing like it. And it carries you through all the other ones. And I thought, that's it exactly. Intermittent rewards, serve others, and um, celebrate those successes, as we said earlier. So I'm going to wrap up by, hopefully this will work, and hopefully you'll hear it. If not, um, we'll cut it off. But th the point of this, maybe you've seen this, is Oliver Mabel. And it really succinctly summarizes our, our new video world. And the point of the slide is to use humor. You know, humor is so important. Appropriate humor, I think, can carry us through really tough times. And especially in the helping profession, we all have our, our um, sort of our, our humor that's unique to each of our professions. But, um, you know, remember humor. Remember that. So let's see how this goes. And can we hear? No sound, Rick. Oh, okay. Um, let me try real quickly to see if, if this works. Is there sound? Did that work? Yeah, there's sound there. Pardon me? Yeah, we can hear it. Okay. Barely. Probably just have to turn it up a little bit more. Okay, let me try it. Okay, so basically an update as to where we are. I can see you both with... Uh, Is it, is it working okay or no? Still a little too low. Okay. So, um, so anyway, the point, sorry guys, um, um, the point of the slide was just to um, just to remember to use humor, use use humor in an appropriate way, and um, you know, as I said earlier, it can it can take us through some tough times. But but this was basically two coworkers that are dogs and um, their boss, and they're having a conversation. One is really good with technology, one not so good. Um, so if you have a chance and you want to take a look at it, um, you can maybe access it through the slide or just look up Olive and Mabel. And, um, and you'll find it, but it's, it's hilarious actually. Everyone that I've showed it to has um, really enjoyed it. So sorry about that. And uh, we have just a couple of moments. Are there any questions before we wrap up? Uh, no questions, uh, Rick, just a bunch of comments, a bunch of um, echoing on your part of, you know, the self care part. It's hard to take care of others if, if you're not stable, mentally stable, physically stable. So the you are your own caregiver. So I, I think everyone was just highly emphasizing that part. So well received. Great. Yeah, take care of yourselves. Thank you for all that you do. I mean, you, it's amazing. You know, it's, it's just nice. I love getting together with people that help people. Um, and just, you know, making that connection because it's amazing what, what you all accomplish in the course of a day. And, you know, just take a moment and pat yourselves on the back. And um, thank you so much for having me here today. As I said, it's an honor. And, um, you know, if you ever have a question or, or would like to get in touch with me, I'm pretty easy to find. Um, 
you can just look for Rick Vinay at the Solutions Group, and you can you'll find me. So, um, or you can call our number and and uh, and just say you need to speak with the man. I'm the only man in the office, <laughs> so it always gets to me. <laughs> sometimes that's great. Sometimes it's not so good. Depends on on why they need to talk to me. So anyway, thank you again for attending, and um, I'll turn it back over to Alfredo. Thank you, Rick. Um, great presentation. It looks like um, no questions in, but we will make your slides available to a few of the, or, or to everyone that actually attended. Mm -hmm. And they really wanted to make sure that they watched that video, the, the, the humor part. To, yeah. you, you know, humor is such a, a natural emotion that we all need to, to keep moving forward. So I um, really appreciate that. And it's, um, such a great opportunity to have you here. So congratulations for all your hard work and, and everyone for participating. This was really, really fun. Thank you so much, guys. Enjoy your afternoon. Thank you all.